Okay, walking up to the front door. Coming into the front door. Okay, here's the living room. You probably saw most of it from your Christmas part of the tape. And here's all these beautiful windows I keep telling everybody about. They still wrap around. Yes, Tucker? Yes? No? Okay. Okay. Let Mommy finish taping. That's so cute. Okay, this is the first thing you see. When this room had no furniture in it, it was quite astounding. I'm not old. I'm only 25. It took me 25 years to get here. When did that happen? I don't remember this happening. But I'm only 25. It is 2021, and my parents are moving out of the house I grew up in. A monstrous abode, made affordable by its location, the Midwest. But the square footage on the listing, nor the rooms counted by the census, make this house special. It's the years. They have been threatening to move to Florida for a while now. Over five years ago, they bought a house, and they've been going back and forth ever since while my mother waited for a kidney transplant. She received the kidney a year ago, which means it's time to move for real. Since leaving for college, I feel like I've moved out three times. Once to the dorms, where I take little more than clothes and my computer, then to an off-campus apartment, where I took more furniture to furnish the place. And once more to Chicago, where I took even more furniture. Having moved out three times prior prepared me for this. And yet, as you can expect, there was something tangibly different this time. It was as if my favorite store was having a going-out-of-business sale. I had to act now where the things that I may have wanted would be gone forever. I had one last chance to get it right, to move out for real, and only three days to do it all while stepping carefully to avoid the quick stand of nostalgia all around me. I started in the basement. The trouble is, I didn't really want to start anywhere. The endeavor was just too overwhelming. I felt like the judge, jury, and executioner of my memories. What deserved to be remembered? What was I going to forget? Only time would tell. I had to start somewhere. The easiest room was my mother's office, consisting mostly of her yarn, a closet I don't dare enter for fear of being buried alive under an avalanche of acrylic and wool. The computer I used to play video games on waits beneath the desk to be recycled. There is very little for me in this room, and even less in the guest bedroom. This became my room ever since I took my bed on the second move out, a helpful hint that I didn't truly live here anymore. With two rooms down, progress astounding and morale high, I traveled across the carpet into the unfinished part of the basement. This is where the trouble starts. The unfinished part of the basement was, at one point, an endless mystery to me. It seemed to just keep going, a sea of boxes my parents never unpacked from the move from New Jersey. I've had dreams to this effect, the corners of the basement extending forever, the boxes remaining packed. The furnaces also captivated my youthful interest. The pilot light, the ignition, the flames, my fear of falling into the drainage hole. True respect, I always wore my orange hunting hat in the basement. I felt safe in it. Also stored here, as well as in the attic, are my old Halloween costumes. Unable to part with them once they were used, they were lashed to the ceiling, also awaiting their day to be recycled. The server farm didn't come until later. I use the term server farm loosely. It was a few desktops tied together with ethernet cables and hope. Setting this up, building the end computer and acquiring the others often for free, was a welcome distraction. See, at the time, I was going through my first real breakup. This server farm, as well as the excitement of the basement refinish and the new technologies that came with it, were both exciting and distracting. The basement refinish was a result of a lightning strike outside our home taking the integrated stereo system and everything else connected to cable out with it. Insurance paid for the majority of the upgrades since simply replacing the broken parts would result in an incompatible system due to the age of its constituent parts. 
The ground floor was always the cool place to hang out. The large TV, family movie nights, sports, this is where it all happened. Perhaps it's the more contemporary memories that hold the most magnetism. When I finally felt brave enough to invite my friends over, this is where it was. Horror movies and PS3 games carried the weight of those nights. <laughs> oh, there you the basement was redone at what I considered to be one of the inflection points of my personality. The blue suede couches were taken away and replaced with electric recliners. Uh, the thick projection television I set my Animal Crossing world up on was replaced with a high-definition flat screen. I've already drained this room dry, for the most part. That entire setup followed me to Chicago, minus the television. I even wanted to take one of the blue suede chairs. It's a very comfortable chair. I also take some of the books from my dad's office. The really old, really cool books that he has no place for in Florida. It was in this room I learned about rock and roll and computer programming. The lower floor was packed. This was, unfortunately, the simple part. Tomorrow comes the harder upper floor where, admittedly, most of my life was lived. And yet, I couldn't help but think of all the formative moments I've experienced down here. Witness to all were the walls, the photographs, the fireplace, the bar, the basements, the computers, the pipes, and the carpet. Oh god, the carpet, both old and new, a texture so plain yet comforting and unforgettable. Every sensation felt, every experience lived, every book read, every song heard, every feeling experienced. How could I abandon it all? I think about the basement. I think of all the nights I spent in it, alone, with only my imagination, and my imagination's imagination. I think of all the times I've been there with friends, and the times I've been there with family, and the times I don't even remember. I think about how it's a place that's always been there, and always will be. I think about what it means to me and who I am as a result of it. I think about the basement. Opposite to how I treated the downstairs, I started with the hardest part first, my room. Technically, two rooms joined together by a Jack and Jill bathroom. Being an only child has its perks. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Perhaps by adhering to my strict rule of scheduling emotions for a later date, I was able to rip it off like a band-aid. But at this point in the process, I was already mentally exhausted. I just wanted to get through it. I already took so much from these rooms. How could there be more? I primarily only took furniture, and the memories were in the small things, the hidden things. I know the question is inevitable. What am I going to do with all this stuff? I've heard it a lot throughout this process, and I've asked it of myself as well. At first, I had a response ready. I had a place to put it all, a storage unit in the middle of Illinois. But that wasn't the point. I was merely scheduling the emotion for a later date. Each thing has a concrete memory attached to it. It's almost like you can tell a story based on the things in a room. I'm leaving behind similar stories as I leave. As I go through each room, I feel like I'm saying goodbye to these stories. It's not just the physical items I have to let go of, but the emotions I have attached to them. I have to let go of the memories, the feelings. I'll have to rely on others to relay what they think my life was like growing up here. I have to rely on videos and tapes, an incomplete representation of the past. Looking through all the things I didn't take, it occurred to me that while these things would be lost, I would still exist. All of these years of formation, and I'm the result? Am I the thing that was formed? Or am I just an echo of the things that formed me? I guess it doesn't matter. Maybe I'm both. And who knows? Maybe that's okay. As I go through the room, I realize how many things I'm holding on to. Things that don't mean anything to anyone but me. I knew it would be hard, and I'm glad it is. I don't know who will love these things like I have, but I know I've done everything I possibly can to make sure they go to someone who will love them. Or maybe they'll end up in a landfill. I guess everything ends up there eventually. And yet, I can take the things and the memories that are attached to them. I can't take the walls, the floors, the windows, the doors. I can't take the smell of the house. 
I can't take the feeling of being in this house. But I can take the things that will remind me of the layout of the house, the feeling of the house. And I can take the things that remind me of the people that were in the house. As I go through each room, it's with a sense of detachment. I can't help but feel like I'm saying goodbye to the house itself, as if it were a person. There are too many stories from the upstairs to pick the ones I want to convey. Too many vague recollections that weren't captured on tape, but might be saved somewhere else. Faded from my memory, yet somewhere in this house. I might miss it. But this is my last chance to miss it. Someday, it'll all just be a memory. Someday, I won't be able to remember the way the carpet felt under my feet, the way the walls felt, the way the floor creaked. I formed attachments to everything here, including the structure around me, but I have to remember that the sum of the experience is greater than the parts. I've only ever owned one car. It's the car I've wanted ever since I saw it advertised on television in 2004. The Subaru Baja is such a unique car, delighting me with its half-truck, half-car appearance. Not quite either, but vaguely decent at being both. I love the Subaru Baja, and on the 6th day of May 2013, I was the proud owner of this fantastic vehicle. Except, I felt I was in the minority with this opinion. People don't understand the Baja, even though there's nothing really to understand. Sure, in the Midwest, it's a little silly, as its name suggests, it's designed for beach off-roading with surfboards in the back. My high school friends occasionally refer to it as the Faggotmobile, even though it has a turbo. In fact, it was the turbo that allowed me to justify the practicality of keeping the car. In 2014, I had to replace the turbo assembly, a very expensive operation. And then a year later, the day I was moving into college, the car was totaled. I had some of the car fixed, but aesthetically, it was never the same. Driving it, however, never changed. It still ran the same as the day I got it, so I continued to use it until I moved to Chicago. The insurance and registration had lapsed since it was just sitting in my parents' garage. So how do you move a car that's illegal to drive? The answer? With great difficulty. I was already renting a U-Haul box truck for the stuff I was taking, and they offer ways to move cars as well. I had to use a full auto transport instead of a car dolly because the Baja is all-wheel drive and disconnecting the drive shaft is difficult. U-Haul does not have many of these full auto transports. This car took me to school, both near and far. It took me to friends' houses, it took me to theater rehearsals, it took me to the movies, dances, dates, parks, hospital visits, work, and back home. I like to think that one day, I'll fix the car. Sure, it may never pass inspection in most states, but my parents live in Florida now, and that state will register anything that isn't on fire. With Wesley's help, I was able to load the car onto the transport and get the boxes, furniture, and tools into the truck. He not only came to help lift things, but also to drive the U-Haul since he has far more experience with towing things. I probably could have done it, but in the end, I'm glad he was the one to do the majority of the towing. Especially backing up. This was not a good time to get familiar with that mechanic. Right, just a little less. Come on. And suddenly, we were done. I drove away, knowing that it's almost certainly the last time I'll set foot in the house. The drive to Normal, Illinois from St. Louis is three hours. It's uneventful. Wesley and I unload the truck and park the car. We gas up and head up to Chicago. I'll be back to St. Louis very soon, but by the time I get back, it'll no longer be in a state of home limbo. You might wonder, what's the point? Why go through the effort of making this video? Why bother releasing it? It's just a mix of old and new footage hastily edited together that nobody cares about. Much like the house itself, it means nothing to anybody outside of a small group of people. Nobody cares. And maybe that is the point. Or maybe it's just some hashtag deep platitude I came up with. It doesn't matter. On the second day of packing, we order lunch from Pizzarelli's, a nearby pizza place. 
In the time we lived in Baldwin, pizzarellis changed hands several times. The recipe occasionally changed too, often declining in quality slightly, but it ultimately remained the best slice of New York-style pizza you could get near my house. The interior of the place hasn't changed. It's exactly the same as I remember it. I eat the pizza with my family in the kitchen. It's delicious, no matter how many times the recipe has changed. There will always be other pizzas. Some better, some worse, but there will always be more pizza. Deep dish, thin crust, Detroit style, DiGiorno, there will always be more pizza. There is no such thing as a non-formative year. We don't notice ourselves changing in the same way we don't notice the Grand Canyon getting deeper. Everything that happens to us every day erodes us into who we are tomorrow at any time scale. It isn't just the things we catch on film or the things we experience in a certain place or during a certain time. The formative years never end. And yet, there will still be pizza. There will always be painful goodbyes, and there will always be a pizza that's your favorite, no matter how many other pizzas there are, because it's the pizza you grew up with. But there will always be pizza no matter where you go. The pizzas will come, and the pizzas will go. But you will always remember the pizza. And the pizza, if it could, would always remember you.